Okay. So today, today we're going to um, basically set up kind of what happened with Katrina and talk a little bit about the beginnings of Katrina, and we'll probably run out of time um, there. So we'll pick the rest of this up, uh, uh, you know, throughout the um, a after Tom's um, Woodland presentation next week. So. Um, what I want to first start off, though, before we talk about Katrina, um, is just the fact that, uh, so I want to talk about the stuff in context, and I want to talk about hurricanes in general, so we have some, we have some ideas. Yeah, sorry, you guys, is there, oh, maybe, you guys coming out of this thing so loud? What the hell's going on? Why do I hear stuff like, okay. Um, anyway, okay, so let's talk about this, let's talk about uh, setting the stage. So... This is the proper context with which to think about um, hurricanes and tropical storms. These are storm tracks um, since uh, 1965. So there's a lot of tropical storm, there's a lot of hurricane, there's a lot of moving air impact that happens across um, all over the planet. But in the case of what we're talking about here, the Gulf Coast of the US happens all the time. Um, these, these issues are fundamental to us. So we're here in Southern California or Southern Oregon uh, or Texas or wherever, wherever we're, we're watching this from. Um, and sometimes some of the initial arguments are why, do we, why are we going to another part of the country? Why are we going to another location? So I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, first and foremost, what happened in Louisiana is part of our country. So this is, these are our brothers and sisters. This is part of our big, awesome gumbo of a culture. So it, is, it did happen to us, even though it wasn't physically next to us. But then two, um, the lessons of Katrina and the, the insights and the, the stories are directly applicable all over the place. To us, uh, to our friends, et cetera. These are natural disasters. These are uh, now the rubric we use for big natural disasters is a billion dollar natural disaster. Meaning, the di when the wildfire, when the hurricane, whatever hits, it's going to cause at least a billion dollars worth of damage. And then we'll start checking it out. And then we'll start tallying it, right? And so this is just for um, the year 2022, um, the billion dollar disasters. Um, and you see some of them are hurricane type things, some of them are wildfire type things. These, yeah, sorry, Suzanne, do you have a question? Wasn't me, I didn't say anything. Okay, okay. Um, so, so, you know, all kinds of impacts all over the place and they're becoming more numerous. So this is, again, just the billion dollar disasters, just the disasters that happen that, that go to at least the $1 billion mark, and many of them go significantly beyond the $1 billion mark. But what we can see is, so here we, this is uh, tracking since the uh, 1980s, um, these, these dark uh, lines. And then the, mo the last few years are in color. So you could pick uh, 2022 is this, red line, is this red line with the explosion uh, asterisk uh, kind of deal here. Uh, 2020 is, is the purple. Um, and what you see is, um, uh, in this case, this is the number of events, but we'd see a similar story if we put the total cost of the events. Um, as we go through time, the more recent years, it's higher than the, than the 90s, it's higher than the 80s, and so these events are happening more and more frequently. And there's all kinds of reasons to, to learn about this, even if we're not gonna become a disaster expert or an or a, um, you know, emergency manager. Um, and so this is one of them, and so this is, uh, uh, my friend over there, um, I'm not sure if he's alive right now. So this morning I got a text that he is in a hotel in a city in southern, southern uh, Turkey that collapsed. So this is a friend of mine that I work with in, in Turkey and um, I hope he's alive. I'm hoping and praying he's alive. Um, they just pulled out an hour before class started. They just pulled out his, uh, one of his co-instructors. He was teaching a he was teaching um, a course on ecotourism to, to Turks so that they could bring tourists and they could bring in money to areas to help uh, have more direct support for villagers, mostly very poor villagers, Turkish, Kurdish villagers. Um, and so he was leading a training. They were staying in a hotel when the earthquake happened. 
uh, the hotel collapsed, unfortunately. And um, two of his colleagues, unfortunately, were uh, found um, deceased. They just pulled out an hour before class started. They just pulled out one of his um, co-instructors, okay. So I'm hopeful that, that, that he's going to be all right. But, um, and that, this is the, the Twitter feed coming out of there. There's all kinds of news crews there. There's, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, this is what we're talking about, right? Crappy disasters, crappy response, crappy planning is bad for everyone. It's bad for our friends. It's bad for environmental justice. It's bad for nature. And the cost of this stuff is getting super, super crazy. The cost of this is getting, um, is getting uh, just too, ex too expensive, right? Our ability to be resilient in the face of these disasters is getting more and more difficult to achieve, right? And so we need, so one of the things we do by studying what happened in the past and what went wrong and what went right, we can better, um, now we're, we're never, it's always, some people are gonna be in the wrong place, wrong time and that kind of stuff, but, but we can minimize that, right? And this is increasingly becoming a, a large priority um, for not just us, but people across the planet in Turkey and elsewhere. Let's talk a little bit about Turkey. This is upbeat, upbeat is after me. Yeah, jo uh, hold on a second. Yeah, John, sorry. Yeah, John. John Boy, go for it. John, I can't hear you. I shut this down. You couldn't, you couldn't hear the video? You couldn't hear me talking at all? Talking at all. The sound cut off. When I, uh, so when I started talking about like the intro of the lecture? No, we, we heard all that and then... Uh, before you start showing the video, oh, okay. you uh, sound cut off. Oh, it must have been when I did this. <laughs> Is that better? We can hear you now. Okay. Can you, st can you still hear me when I talk now? Still can, st can you still hear me? Yeah, I am. Can you not hear me? Hmm. Okay. Not sure what's going on. We can't hear you now. Okay, not sure what's going on. I'm going to leave this on then. How about that? You can hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, I'm going to leave this on. Okay. I'm unclear what is happening here. Okay, uh, so you guys, you guys can hear audio all right, John Boy? Okay, all right. Okay. Yep. All right, so let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about hurricanes. So hurricanes are actually really, really impactful, and I don't think most of you probably appreciate that or understand that. So um, I, I, could, I could stay here for two hours and go through all the, the crazy implications for human history of hurricanes, but I'll just give you a few. So the, one of the uh, classic ones that we reiterate is Kublai Khan, when he comes, this is in Asia, right? When he comes across uh, uh, the, the Straits and he goes and he invades Japan, uh, he's coming in there and he's like, hey, I'm gonna come, you know, kill these folks and take over this land, this crazy hurricane spin, what we now call a hurricane, actually in that part of the world we call it a typhoon, but it's the same exact phenomenon. Typhoon comes up, smacks and destroys his invasion fleet and kills a bunch of people and destroys a bunch of boats. And the Japanese people say, fantastic, this was an act of God. And so that's where we get the term kamikaze from, divine wind. Divine wind is gonna come and save, in this case, save a people from destruction. So uh, the Japanese empire could thank hurricanes for keeping it alive back then. In our own country, um, uh, when Columbus is coming from Western Europe to, to land in the Americas and, and do all this uh, stuff, um, he, he and his fellow travelers, you know, we, we have this we have this impression that they come in, they slaughter all the native folks, and they did. But what they first did was they, 
they, they didn't know anything. So they were like, hey, what's up? And they were first like, let's trade some stuff and let's talk about stuff. And so when they did that, they picked, in, picked up a lot of what we would now call traditional ecological knowledge. So they learned from the local peoples in the, in the Caribbean um, about, uh, about these, these frequent storms that happened all the time, right? Um, and one of the signals was um, when the morning, when the sun is rising and it's super, super red, that's a signal there might be a big giant storm coming, right? And so, um, in fact, uh, they survived. Um, be, so, so, so they heard about these storms. And so the exploration fleet um, uh, avoided storms when they could. Um, and in fact, it, there was such worry about it that uh, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand told them, hey, don't go to this, this Hispaniola, the island of Hispaniola, because that's like super dangerous. And he was like, whatever, we're just going to do this anyway. And, and long story short, uh, most of their boats on the fourth voyage were destroyed um, by a hurricane, what we now call a hurricane. Um, and indeed, the, the words that we use for hurricane are, are very similar across the whole Caribbean, from the Yucatan over to the islands. There's just variants, but this idea of hurricane and all that kind of stuff, that became our term for hurricane. We flash forward a little bit farther, and actually this hurricane is one of the reasons we are a country. We survive. So the revolution is happening, and the American rebels are fighting the British imperial power, right? the giant empire of the, of the day, incredibly strong uh, forces and very sophisticated technology for the time, all that kind of stuff. And uh, as... And, and, and so, um, you know, we Americans had a very crappy uh, fleet. We had a very, not, not even really a real navy, right? So if it wasn't for the French that were helping us out, we wouldn't have been able to, to deal with the um, English imperial um, naval forces and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the reasons we were able to hold off some of the invasion and some of the naval prowess was a hurricane that came into the Lesser Antilles in 1780 and it nuked the fleet, nuked the British fleet. And so they had to recoup, they had to, they had to try to rebuild masts and all that kind of stuff. And that allowed um, the Americans and then the French to help out with the Americans get a toehold and, and, and be decisive. Um, and, uh, and eventually Cornwallis would surrender at Yorktown because he didn't have all the, I mean, many reasons, but one of the reasons he, did, he didn't have the reinforcements thanks to that that hurricane. In more recent times, probably the most, most important hurricane before um, you know, modern era was the hurricane that gave birth to the National Weather Service. The hurricane that was the last major hurricane before we started naming them. So normally, so from here on out and for our class, we'll, we might talk about Hurricane Charlie or, or, or Katrina or whatever, or Ida more recently in, in New Orleans. And so that's how we refer to them. You know, hurricane and then a name. Here, this, this, was a, this is an unnamed storm. So in this case, we just refer to it as the Galveston hurricane of 1900. This was insane. This is why, so I'm a football fan, uh, and I, my team is, unfortunately, the Dallas Cowboys. Um, the reason, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. you're welcome. Uh, the reason why um, my team is the Dallas Cowboys, the reason why the Tennessee Titans or sorry, what am I saying? Jeez, I'm getting all flustered. Uh, the, 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 um, the Texans play in Houston is because of this storm. So the powerhouse, the epicenter, all of the political might in Texas was concentrated in Galveston. Galveston is a, is a small island just off the main coast. Um, and and Galveston had everything. Galveston had opera houses, and Galveston had major banking and huge trade, and all this stuff was going on. And Galveston was the was the jam, right? Galveston was the place. But it's a small, low-profile island, sand primarily, sand spit island, and a um, uh, huge number of folks. Forty thousand people back in 1900 was huge, you know, large, large population. Um, this hurricane comes up, no warning, right? So we don't have a weather system at the time. 
We don't have satellites or anything like that. And uh, so people were, were unprepared and this big giant storm came and literally submerged the whole of the island or virtually all of the island. And so we have no idea how many people died. At least 6,000 people died, possibly as much as 10,000, possibly as much as one in four people on the island died immediately. This was crazy. This leads to this massive impact. It's never recovered. The city of Galveston has never recovered, right? If you listen to tourist brochure, brochures and everything, they'll tell you, hey, come on and visit Galveston, but it never recovered. The financial center went to Houston, and then Houston became, now Houston is our fourth largest city in the US, um, our most diverse city. Uh, and, uh, and, and then Dallas split off later after that. And so, so that all happened because this was destroyed and people were like, we're done, we're not, we're not going back there anymore, right? Um, yeah, I'll just say that. Um, this is a type of structure that we don't have on the West Coast, but is very common in Louisiana and on the East Coast. It's, it's a, a barrier island. You and I, when we take a rock and we walk out to Point Magoo, and we take that rock and we throw it as hard as we can and it goes, who knows, 100 feet, 200 feet, whatever, and it plunks in the water and it sinks, it's going to sink to... I don't know, 30 feet, 60 feet, something like that, right? Boom, boom. If we do that same thing you know, on the shore of Texas or in South Carolina or in Florida, do that same thing, take that same size rock, throw it as, just as far as we, as we um, did here, it's gonna go plop and it's gonna sink like, I don't know, like three feet, four feet. These coasts in the US are very shallow. So we are a geologically young coast, we here in California and the, West, the whole West Coast actually, right? So we're new land, we're like new stuff, we're just jagged, we're on the edge, right? These other areas of our country are very, very old and they're all eroded. So not only is the land flat as we go into the ocean, the, the subsurface topography is also very shallow. And so that allows for things like sand and sediments to accumulate and build up. That essentially never happens here. Our Channel Islands, the rock. The, the islands off of Baja in Mexico, the rock, right? The Farallons, rock. When we go to these areas, these little islands are an accumulation of sediment. And so that's what's underlying this. Um, in the case of the 1900 earthquake, these small little, I think about the back of a turtle or an abalone shell, that's sort of like what these islands are, are sort of shaped like. The highest point on the island was eight, a, a little more than eight and a half feet but the storm surge was 15 feet. We'll talk about storm surge in a, in a minute. Um, so there was nowhere to be safe, unless you're in a building and you somehow climbed into the second or third story. Um, so, so huge problems. Um, uh, as we'll see with Katrina, before the storm, people started saying, hey, we've had some problems with previous storms. Maybe we should take some you know, proactive action to do something. And so, so you know, we didn't have a whole lot of technology back then in the day. People said, what if we build a wall between the land and the, and the ocean to sort of minimize any kind of stuff? And people were like, yeah, no, that's so expensive. We could never do that. That's stupid, right? Or that's, that's a folly or some such thing, right? Um, after, after the hurricane, they're like, oh my God, we got to build some seawalls, right? So now the, city, the, the island of Galveston is surrounded by a giant seawall. Um, and, uh, and it's hugely problematic and it causes all these, these issues. Um, um, this is what that destruction looks like. So after, right after the storm, um, you know, almost everything is, is nuked. There's a few, there's some buildings that survive like this stone church uh, 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 steeple thing that survived. But th this picture here on the upper right, that's just dead bodies. And this is dead bodies after dead bodies after dead bodies for days and days and days and days. Um, you know, huge, huge, and, and this picture here on the left, which is very much like what the areas in Turkey are like right now today, this is what you're found, finding, right? It's not like a dead body in the middle of the street. It's, it's dead body inside of destroyed infrastructure and how do you even just physically navigate that? Um, and so starting in 1902 and then taking several years, they start building the seawall and it takes several years, but now, now the, the, the area is protected, but it's not perfect. 
because the storm surges, because the storms are getting stronger and stronger. So this is Hurricane Ike in 2008. Um, and, and so what we're looking at here is, a, is um, the seawall. And in this case, there's a memorial to, to storm, people that died from the previous storms. And this uh, waves are starting to break over that, that uh, memorial, right? So, so we need to think proactively about these disasters and we need to think not just what the historic pattern was, but actually take seriously the predictions for what future conditions may look like and design for those future conditions. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, hurricanes. So what are they? So these are all the same type of thing. These are all um, um, spinning masses of air or cyclonic storms. Um, again, uh, typhoon, hurricane, depends on which, which ocean basin we're in, but it's the same phenomenon. Um, hurricane is in the Atlantic and Pacific, um, actually the Western Pacific. Um, near Asia, we use the term cyclones and typhoons. Um, the difference here is just the intensity of the storm. So, uh, so it's all the same physical phenomenon, physics. Um, it's just how we refer to them and the strength. So we start with a tropical depression, a small storm. Then we get to a tropical storm, or what some, sometimes people like weather men will just say a storm is coming. That's what they're talking about. Um, a hurricane is uh, when we get up to a certain wind speed. And then a major hurricane is when it gets beyond another uh, critical mass. And, um, and we're in the process of changing the definitions of these things, which um, I'll, I'll touch on. But, but this is the classic definition of, of hurricanes we're using here. OK, so we're going to start with physics. Any questions so far? Making sense? It's OK? OK. So we're going to start with the physics of what goes on. Um, uh, we now measure hurricanes by categories. So we go from category one to category five. This is based solely on wind speed. This, this categorization comes from people working in the disaster recovery industry. In, in fact, it comes from folks working for the American Red Cross working in Latin America. And what was happening was they were, you know, so, so we have a disaster, uh, the aid groups go in, but before they go in, they need to send some initial reconnaissance folks, right, to just sort of check the lay of the land for the first day or two to say, like, you know, do we need to give people water? Do we need to bring people blankets? You know, what, what, what exactly do we need, right? Um, and so um, these folks working for the Red Cross were trying to figure out a way to, to communicate more succinctly and more standard, in a more standardized way how, you know, was this a bad hurricane? Was, you know, was this bad or really, really bad or insanely bad kind of thing, right? And, and so they started looking back at historic disasters. And what they found is that, that one of the best predictors of how damaged structures were, which is one of the main things that they were working on, was how, uh, was how intense was the wind, was the wind that, in that particular storm. And because they're mostly dealing with folks that didn't have a lot of money and, you know, sort of in poorer villages and stuff, um, wind in particular would impact roofs and, and things of that nature. And so they said, okay, we're going to use wind speed. And so they just essentially came up with, okay, let, let's break it up into, you know, a useful, you know, 10 was probably too hard. One or two didn't seem like enough. So five seemed to be the right number, essentially. So it's very much a practical, um, a practical generation. And they came up with our current measurement, which is category one is 74 to 95 miles per hour, category two, 96, et cetera, right? And some people now say, oh my God, we need something, we need something higher than a category six because hurricanes are starting to get you know, more, stronger and stronger as we go through um, our world with climate change. But again, this was originally meant to, to communicate the potential impact to human uh, settlements. Okay, next thing to know about hurricanes, they don't occur everywhere. They only occur on some parts of the planet. And that's because of this. So this is, uh, this is the Coriolis force, right? This is the, the uh, to toilet bowl thing, people sometimes call it, right? So um, Coriolis is not a real force. It's what we call an apparent force, meaning, meaning um, and Coriolis is about curvature, about things bending. There isn't a force bending. What's happening is that you and I are attached to the earth, our feet are on the earth, and then things in the atmosphere aren't attached to the earth. So things in the water column or things in the air 
Um, they might start by moving with you and I, but as soon as you and I let go of them, they, they kind of do their own deal. And that's what we're illustrating here. So, so this spinning disc right here, you can imagine is the earth, or if that's harder to imagine, you can just imagine it's a, um, it's a, uh, a merry-go-round at a playground, right? And so here on the lower left, we have this little gun and I'm shooting out a Nerf ball out of the gun. So I go, poomp, and I shoot the Nerf ball, and it goes in a straight line, right? So that's all it's doing, the ball. So I, I make the ball go, and then it's going straight, 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 straight. But if we trace out its path on the blue, if we trace out its path on the merry-go-round, what we see is this red curvature path. So it looks like, from the perspective of somebody sitting on the merry-go-round, it looks like it's bending to the right when it's not. But this bending, we can only bend so much. We can only bend so much. And so eventually we're gonna be bending so much that instead of going towards the, the pole or the equator, we're gonna be going sideways, right? And that defines these different circulation cells on our, in our, on our the atmosphere of our Earth. There's something similar happens in the ocean, but, but we'll just talk about the atmosphere here. And so that leads to these different chunks of air. And in fact, this is what sailors use when they sail by wind, for example, right? So, so it means that in certain latitudes, the wind's going to be going towards the west, and in others, it's going to be going towards the east, et cetera. So this, this creates these different bands of, of areas, and it also says why we never have a hurricane that crosses the equator. And so this area right near the equator is the golden spot for hurricanes. So the area sort of you know, around, her, around uh, you know, this part of Africa and then the area up here on this part of Africa are really where the action is all about. What this is, is a big spinning, um, just, like, just like when you take a bath, you take a bath tonight or tomorrow morning or whenever you take a bath, and then you, you pull the dra drain plug out and the water will just kind of you know, go down. But if you take your finger, and give a little bit of a swirl, yeah, a little bit of a swirl, you can start a little, a little spinning. And then you take your finger out, and even though your finger's not there anymore, the water starts to go in a funnel, right? That, that type of phenomenon, that's what a cyclonic storm is. And so um, there's all kinds of structure in here which we don't need to go into, but suffice it to say, what's gonna go on is we have some spinning air, and we're not entirely sure, we, we, we know the evolution of how these storms happen, but we're not 100% sure exactly why they start every single time. There's some amount of disturbance, and we know the things that are correlated with making a storm, but we can't predict 100% of the time where every single storm is going to happen. But essentially what's gonna happen is this storm is gonna start, and then it's gonna create its own environment that's gonna be more conducive to making more of it. So a, a storm will start and then unless we break it up, it's going to strengthen, 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 and get stronger and stronger. And essentially what we're going to be doing is sucking in um, energy from the bottom, spinning up, and then it's going to go out um, uh, the top of the storm. Um, is this an animation? I can't remember. No, okay. So now, while this is happening, while this is happening, the winds are spinning around, spinning around, spinning around, spinning around, and the winds are blowing air molecules. They're also blowing whatever else is around it. So in the context of the surface of the ocean, it's going to be blowing against the surface of the ocean. And the same thing, there's all kinds of, for some reason, all my hurricane examples are in a bathtub. I don't know why. But, but so uh, the other thing we want to talk about in terms of hurricanes, and you could do this also the next time you're in a bathtub. So you can get a, a straw or a, um, or a hair dryer, but that could be dangerous. And also I'm bald and I don't use a hair dryer, so I don't know about that. But, but if you take a straw and we go to the edge of the bathtub, right near the, right near the, 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 um, right near the, the edge of the water and blow with our straw towards, towards the lip of the tub, to, toward, towards the outside of the tub, and we blow a little bit on the water, we're gonna get a few ripples, right? If I blow smooth, an even amount of, of force. You're gonna get a little bit of, little bit of, uh, uh, of you know, some ripples and some waves and it's gonna kinda hit the tub and kinda do a little micro splash. If instead I take my straw and I scoot to the back of the tub and I blow, now instead of blowing over a little stretch of water, I blow over a larger stretch of water. What you would see is larger waves, larger oscillation. And we call that fetch. So how long the wind has to blow on that mass of water 
will uh, is referred to as fetch. The larger the fetch, the more wind is blowing on it, the more drag that's going to create it, and the more water that can build up. So in addition to this spinning around and, and knocking us around and, and blowing things, it's also going to be pushing water. And that water is called a storm surge. So when you hear storm surge, a lot of times people think, oh, storm surge. It's like I, it's like I jumped in the bathtub and I created a cannonball and then the water kind of went boom and it went up and then it slopped back down. It's not like that. These storms are often very large structures. So the fetch can be hundreds of miles. And it's not me with a straw. It's not a dude with a, a you know, half an inch pipe. It is all over the atmosphere, right? So it's a huge amount of pressure. So we have, what we're essentially doing is shoving part of the ocean forward. And so when a storm surge happens with a, with a storm, it's not like the waves. We can sometimes think of the waves, like, oh, the tide comes in, it's break, and it goes down. It's like a wave that comes in and just never goes down. And it might stay for an hour, two, three, four, ten hours. So you go from being whatever, you know, dry to all of a sudden underwater for several hours. Again, here in California, in Oregon, on the West Coast, it can be hard to, like, well, whatever, a little, you know, a little bit of elevation of water, whatever. Remember, this is flat land of our country. This is very, very flat, very, very flat. So even though a relatively mild increase in elevation can be huge, can be absolutely huge. So for us, a big tidal range is maybe six feet. So maybe between the high tide and low tide of a day, you know, maybe it's going to, the, the, the average height of the water breaking on the beach is going to be maybe, you know, more than my head or from my head to my feet, right? In this part of the country, a typical tide is like a foot or two, right? So the tidal ranges tend to be smaller, the land tends to be flatter, and all of this makes them much more vulnerable when we have, in particular, the storm surge is going to come ashore. Okay. Uh, making sense? Everybody online okay? Any questions so far? Anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. So, so here we go. So these are what we need to form a hurricane. We need a warm ocean. That's going to give us this, this energy, this, this warm, moist air. We're going to need a fast, cooling atmosphere. And this is going to act like a fireplace, like a chimney in a fireplace. So the air is going to kind of whoop, go up fast. We need um, uh, wet in the, in the higher atmosphere. Um, and again, just because like, like I told you before, we can't be super close to the equator because we need, the wind needs to be able to spin, have that Coriolis effect. So we need to be, um, you know, not right on the equator. And then we need some kind of spark. As I mentioned, we don't really understand exactly the spark. Um, a lot of it seems to be related to dust blowing off, at least for, for our Atlantic hurricanes, dust blowing off of the Sahara. But Again, not entirely sure, but some spark, some spark. And then once it gets going in the, the critical formation time, before it's super, super strong, we can't come in and go like, ah, and kind of bang, bang in, right? So we can't have disturbing winds, crosswinds that would come uh, make it aborted, okay? So if we have all these things in place, then we can get a hurricane. So... Let's turn to, turn to start to talk about what happened with Katrina. So this is 2005, summer of 2005. And um, uh, first, we have you know, what's going on this year. But then we also have in the atmosphere, we have these longer term patterns. You guys might have heard of El Nino or the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So these things um, are sort of a, a, a multi-year average of things getting more or things getting less, depending on what, what variable we're talking about. And so in 2005, in the lead up to Katrina, um, we were already in what we call an active multi-decadal signal. We were already in an era where we were seeing more hurricanes than quote unquote normal, right, than, than, than on average. We'd been in this condition since 1995, so we've had a decade of this going on. Right? And this doesn't mean every single year, but on average, these, ear, these years tended to be uh, more hurricanes than not. The only exceptions were during when we had strong El Ninos in 1997 and uh, 2002. 1997, the El Ninos were so strong here at, at Point Loma kelp bed um, off of San Diego. The storm scoured an inch of rock 
um, 30 feet down on the, on the reef. So these were very, very strong El Nino systems. So it took these very strong systems to sort of mess up the atmospheric cycling. But other than those years, we were getting a lot of hurricanes uh, in the lead up to Katrina. Then on the specific uh, weeks leading up, yeah. So you say, are you saying like a rock that was like below 30 feet of water became like revealed? Yes, uh, a scour removed an inch, an inch of rock on the reef that was, that was underneath the ocean. The storms were so intense, it scoured an inch of that up. Yeah, so these are very strong uh, El Nino years. Uh, okay, so uh, then we had a higher than normal sea surface temperature, so the surface temperature of the ocean. Remember we said that that hot water is going to be one of the fuels for, to help us get going and, and to feed the fuel. And then we, needed, and we, ha we had favorable winds and air pressure. So when you put all this together, um, the conditions, the predicted conditions before we hit the, the, the meat of the hurricane season, which is basically summer to, to early fall, we were predicted to be 175% above hyperactive season. This is crazy. This is insane, right? This is like people screaming, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's going to be really, really bad. It's going to be really, really, really bad. So we have two entities that predict hurricanes in the U.S. We have an atmospheric group based in Colorado and, an act, and, a, and a group at the National Hurricane Center in Florida. And they do, they do sort of independent, they, they kind of work together, but they also do independent checks. And both of these groups, their modeling efforts are saying, oh my God, it's going to be a really, really bad year. Everybody should really, really pre pre prepare. If you're a homeowner, make sure you have the ability to you know, put storm shutters on, make your evacuation plan. Like, you guys got to get ready. Okay. This is what the North Atlantic hurricane season was like before Katrina. So this is 1950 to 2005. And so... Uh, and this is, this is above normal, near normal, below normal, the, the overall average, right? And so what we have here is tropical storms, hurricanes. And so remember, this is all the same thing. It's just this, this one is stronger than this, and this one, the major hurricanes, are stronger than hurricanes, right? Everybody with me on that? Okay, so, so the modeling efforts produce an average, but then they also give us the range. So they say, oh, okay, you know, so, so we're thinking that we're, and, and they're, and they're going to predict and they do this every year, how many you know, storms we get, how many hurricanes, how many major hurricanes, right? Like, you know, so, so people have an idea of what, what to expect. Um, and so you know, in, a, in an above normal season, we would expect maybe four major hurricanes, about eight or, and this is, this is excuse me, these are hurricanes making it to the eastern seaboard of the U.S. These aren't in the middle of the ocean. These, these are ones that get close to us or make landfall. Uh, so, so four major hurricanes if, if we are a really crazy year, eight hurricanes if we are a crazy year, and something like 13 tropical storms. This is what we are predicting in 2005 before Katrina. We're going to have seven major hurricanes. This was just about unprecedented. 15 regular hurricanes on top, in addition to the seven major ones, right? So that's 22 hurricanes. And something like almost 30 um, actual storms. This is what stuff looked like. Uh, so this is the sea surface temperature. So in this upper panel, this is how warm the water is. So the hotter the color, the warmer the surface water is. And then this uh, one is the same thing, but it's showing deviations from normal. And what we see is it was really, really warm as we get really close to the Gulf Coast, and it was, it was abnormally warm. So that's going to give us, oh my gosh, there's, there's more fuel, right? And then wind shear, which is that last thing I mentioned that's going to come in, and, and as the storm is starting to you know, spin around in a circle and starting to spin, uh, wind shear can break that up and can, and can like, defeat it from becoming a, a full storm or a stronger storm. Um, there was very little wind shear up near Florida and Louisiana. So there was very little stuff to stop it once, once something got going. So these were all huge warning signs, huge danger signals. We eventually get Katrina. We'll talk about that in a, in a, in a minute. But, but this is Katrina when it's a Category 5 hurricane, the strongest category that, there, that we have. But note, it's not just the, the wind strength. Look at how big this is. This storm is stretching almost from Florida 
the, the, the core of the storm is spreading almost from Florida to Texas. That is huge. The, one of the things our measurement of hurricanes doesn't do is look at size. Because back in the day when this was created by those folks doing disaster response in, in Latin America, it's, it was like, whatever, you know, we're just, we're just hurricane, hurricane. The, the, our hurricanes are changing. They're getting stronger. The wind speed's getting more intense. They're getting wetter. They are slowing down, so they're not going on average as fast as they used to, which means they're going to hang out over us for a lot longer and cause, you know, have more time to cause damage. And they're more gigante. They're just way, 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 way bigger on average. And so all that together is, is, has led a bunch of researchers, they're, they're working on a new index that would take not just wind speed into it, but also size. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we're not entirely sure, but it has something to do with the amount of pushing that it's experiencing from high upper atmosphere winds. But we don't, we don't, we're not entirely sure why. But but it's definitely happening. So the the destruction in the, the classic one in recent years has been the, the hurricane over Houston, where where Suzanne is. Um, it just basically parked and it just rained for like like three years worth of rain in like eight hours kind of thing, right? And, and again, don't think of Cal you know, California, think rain, like, oh my God, mudslides, right? I mean, that happens there, but, but really there, it's so flat, it like rains and you just go subtitle because there's no place for the water to move quickly, right? Did you have it? Is there, like, if you're looking at all category fives throughout, like since they've been measured, do they, do they reach a certain size to get to that point? Because I know that these hurricanes are getting bigger, but like, do you have small category fives like when it comes to width? Uh, you, you can, you you can. Although increasingly that's not the norm. But but like I really like small, tight, compact. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Hurricane Andrew that hit Florida, um, it wasn't a category five, but it was it was um, I don't remember what I should know that is. I want to say it's like a th it was a three, um, but that was only like sixty miles wide. That one was was amazingly compact. Um, so you can't that it can happen, but on average the the strength seems to be increasing along with the, the total diameter. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, so um, before we turn to talking about what actually happened with Katrina, is that good? Any other questions? People have any other questions? Um, okay, cool. So now let's start adding in some of the people because this is a human phenomenon, right? So we're talking about natural disasters, but increasingly there ain't no such thing as a natural disaster in my humble opinion. We used to use the term natural disaster for an earthquake, for a volcano, right? A lightning strike caused a wildfire, a natural disaster. Increasingly, our humanity is so big. John actually wrote a book on the Anthropocene. So if you guys want to read John's book, you should ask, we should ask him for the link. But so John has written a, a, a textbook on the Anthropocene. And so, so ubiquitous is our presence on this planet. We are so transforming this that there essentially is no such thing as a quote unquote natural disaster anymore. Because everything, even if it was a purely volcanic explosion that people didn't cause or whatever, the consequences are made much more complicated because of what you and I have done. The building pattern that we've done, the settlement pattern, how we transport our food and airplanes that now can't fly because there's dust, in it, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so increasingly, um, we can't talk about disasters as a purely physical phenomenon. It's really the interaction between this physical event or this ecological event or this natural world event interacting with humanity. So one, one quick example before we turn back to uh, Katrina uh, is um, this, so this is um, Hurricane Dorian in 2019. We call these spaghetti models. These are, so, so we have these giant supercomputers when we we're starting to figure out that there's a hurricanes coming and these folks feed in data that we're getting, the meteorologists feed in data and they predict the path of the, the hurricane, the most likely path. And we get a bunch of these things, right? And there's different models, different assumptions. And, and so we run a bunch of different things. And you know, some of them, look at this one over here on the right. Some of them is showing the storm just gonna be out in the ocean, in the Atlantic. Some of them show like this pink one that is gonna be going over you know, near Miami and, and doing that. But most of them tend to be 
pretty similar, right? And so what, what we get in terms of a prediction for the public, to warn the public, is we usually use these. And so these diagrams are, um, are so-called cones of uncertainty, right? So, so far, all we're talking about are, are the scientists, are the, 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 the modelers, right? So here we go. In this case, this illustration was produced um, when the storm was on the southern, just approaching the southern tip of Florida, around the Keys, okay? And what we're, what we're showing is the probable path of the hurricane. It doesn't say the hurricane's gonna go there, but it says the probable path. And so the average, the median, the central line is this, is this black line in the middle, and the red dots will usually have timestamps on. They'll say, okay, at noon it'll be here, at 3 p.m. it'll be here, you know, something of that nature. And as we go through time, um, and the dotted lines here are all the spaghetti diagrams that people were really wanting to get down into it. But basically, essentially, th this cone of uncertainty is what we're talking about, right? And so, and so um, it could be anywhere, right, around this, this um, uh, pink, um, but is really, really strongly likely to be somewhere in this white, right? But, but so we start getting into these things. This is where humans come in. This is where interpretations come. So some people will look at this, and some people will say, ah, well, I don't live in the middle of this black line or in the middle of this red dot, so I'm safe, right? I'm out in the, in the pink zone, so I'm safe. That is not how you should read this. That is not how you should read this. You should read, if you're in the pink, you should get the hell out. If you're in the white, you need to get the hell out an hour ago. Like, you need to really, like, if you're in the pink, maybe you, have, maybe you can take 10 minutes to grab your, your earthquake kit and your, your go kit or whatever, right? If you're in the white, you need to get the hell out right now. Right? And, and you need to not drive north along the spine of Florida, right? Because you're going to be staying in the storm. You want to go sideways somehow, if at all you can, right? So that's how you should read them. So as we start bringing in these warnings, as we start bringing in the science, then that science has to be interpreted. And the classic dumbass move that happened with this hurricane is this guy. So this is the president. This is called Sharpie Gate. And for political reasons, this individual, um, was very interested in misleading the public. And so when the scientists brought him this prediction of this storm, he said, well, actually, it could go over here. So he pulled out a Sharpie and drew this black, black bubble over here to say, oh, it could go to Alabama, it could go to, da -da. it wasn't going to go there, right? There's no reason to further confuse people, but Increasingly, we've seen, I would just say, disingenuous actors be involved with this and, and interject these incorrect interpretations of the quantitative data, of the modeling data, of the warning data, of the we need to be careful with this data. And this tends to push people into stupid political boxes, and then people stop seeing the reality, and they start responding to, to other things. Okay, so next I'm going to show you an excerpt of President George W. Bush's last press conference. So this is, uh, he was, he was uh, President Obama was the president-elect, and this was his last um, press conference in the, the, as president in the White House. And so he's basically taking questions from all these reporters. And this press conference goes on for about an hour. I've edited it down to just a couple minutes here, just the stuff related to Hurricane Katrina. So President George W. Bush was the president when Katrina happened. Um, and, and all the stuff we're talking about here and the rest of the stuff we'll talk about in the class, I am not and we are not trying to demonize anyone or, or, or tell you how to believe this or whatever, but this is the reality, right? And just like we're seeing with our friends in Turkey right now, if we don't demand kick-ass leaders, fantastic uh, 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 ideas to embrace these challenges, we are going to be screwed. So it is not disrespectful to criticize folks. We're not trying to throw anybody under the bus here. We're trying to understand. I want you all to understand what happened with this storm so that we can correct those errors, understand those errors, correct those errors, errors and go forward. So here we go. So a couple things just to explain because you guys are young and you may not remember all this kind of stuff. So, um, so uh, there's, a, there's a couple of reporters. One reporter asked a question. The, pre the president will answer for a little bit. And then I'm going to cut 
to another reporter asking a question. So a few things that are, were asked here is, so he's gonna be talking about the Gulf War, the Iraq War. And uh, one of the things he, President George W. Bush, I'll just say he's, an, here's a, he's a pilot, the term is pilot. You'll hear him talk about helicopter drivers, the term is pilot. Pilots should know that pilots are pilots. Um, but he also, um, in the early on part of the war, he landed on an aircraft carrier and there was a big banner that was put up. So he's gonna talk about that. He's going to talk about another individual, um, an African-American man who was dragged to death in Texas. He touches on that. Uh, and uh, what's the other thing you guys might not remember? Um, yeah, well, anyway, I'll, I'll just let it play, and then we can, we can talk about it after. So here we go. And you guys online, hopefully you guys can hear this. Let me, let me, make, let me put it close so you guys can hopefully hear this. Uh, four years ago, you were asked uh, if you had made any mistakes. Yeah. And I'm not trying to play gotcha, but I wonder, when you look back over the long arc of your presidency, uh, do you think in retrospect that you have made any mistakes? And if so, what is the single biggest mistake that you may have made? Gotcha. Uh, I, look, I'm, I, I have often said that uh, history will look back and determine that which could have been done better or... Um, you know, mistakes I made. It, clearly putting a mission accomplished on an aircraft carrier was a mistake. It sent the wrong message. We were trying to say something differently, but nevertheless it conveyed a different message. Obviously some of my rhetoric has been a mistake. Um, I thought long and hard about Katrina. You know, could I have done something differently? Like land Air Force One? either New Orleans or Baton Rouge. The problem with that and, uh, is that um, law enforcement would have been pulled away from the mission. And then your questions, I suspect, would have been, how could you possibly have flown Air Force One into Baton Rouge and police officers that were needed uh, to expedite traffic out of New Orleans we're taking off the task to look after you. Um, April. Thank yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Um, you were sound asleep back there, so I decided. No. <laughs> no, I wasn't. There was a whole clear row before me. I thought you were going to go there. But either way, thanks for the surprise. Um, Mr. President, um, on New Orleans, you uh, basically talked about a moment ago about the photo opportunity. But let's talk about what you could have done. Uh, to change the situation for the city of New Orleans to be further along in reconstruction than where it is now. And also, uh, when you came or began to run for the Oval Office about nine years ago or so, uh, the James Byrd dragging death was residue on your campaign. And now, at this time, 2009, we have the first black president. Could you tell us what you have seen on the issues of race as you see it from the Sure, United thanks. States? First of all, uh, we did get the $121 billion, more or less, dollars passed, and there is now being spent. Secondly, the school system is improving dramatically. Thirdly, people are beginning to move back into homes. This storm was a devastating storm, April, that required a lot of energy, a lot of focus, and a lot of resources to get New Orleans up and running. And uh, has the reconstruction been perfect? No. Have things happened fairly quickly? Absolutely. And is there more to be done? You bet there is. What more and, needs to be done? Uh, well, the more people need to get in their houses. More people need to, you know, have their own home there. But, but the, the systems are in place to continue the reconstruction of New Orleans. Um, you know, people said, but the federal response was slow. Don't tell me the federal response was slow when there was 30,000 people pulled off roofs right after the storm passed. You know, I, I, I remember going to see those um, helicopter drivers, Coast Guard drivers, to thank them for their courageous efforts to rescue people off roofs. 30,000 people were pulled off roofs right after the storm moved through. It's a pretty quick response. Could things have been done better? Absolutely. Absolutely. But when I hear people say the federal response was slow, then what are they going to say to those chopper drivers or the 30,000 that got pulled off the roofs? Uh, the other part of the look, I, I was affected by TV 
after uh, after the election. <laughs> okay. Um, I would respectfully suggest that when a major American city is destroyed and uh, the federal response is pathetic and doesn't show up for days and days, that it's a little more than um, don't tell me we didn't show up. I think it's objectively, uh, uh, I, 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 that's a, I would respectfully suggest that was a very disappointing um, press conference. I understand that when people, you know, nobody wants to, it's hard to admit when something has gone wrong, but um, there's a lot of not correct statements there. And so uh, over the course of this class, we'll be going over some of this stuff. But this is what our cities were like. This is what the city was like. Um, this is apocalyptic stuff. When humans are on roofs spray painting, please come help me, day three, day four, yes, the, the, that sucks, right? That is incorrect, that is immoral, that is ineffectual. It's particularly ineffectual, and this is something that's hard for you guys to understand as, as we're, we've left the time of it. This is in the wake of 9-11. 9-11 happened, and we were told the world changed. We were told that we have to do all this stuff again, and that the world is dangerous, and we need to have this thing called the Patriot Act, and all these kinds of things, right? Because why? Because we need to protect you, is what we're told. So the systems that were in place to help protect us should have worked for a hurricane, or a nuclear attack, or whatever. They did not. This system that we were assured cost insane amounts of money, massive amounts of bureaucracy, all kinds of civil liberties and issues going on, and this was the test. And it absolutely 100% failed. And so um, one would think, uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to ramble here. So, so what, when I saw this, what I thought of was this. This is one of my favorite paintings in the Louvre in, um, in Paris. <clears throat> this, is, this, um, this reminded me of these pictures of folks here. So what was this? This was, um, this was Twitter. This is Instagram. This is a TikTok of the day. So this is back before we had electronics, right? And so um, the story, so this is a story. Okay, tell me if, you, if it sounds familiar to you. So at the time, the French are trade their big power, imperial power. And they're like, hey, let's go make money. Let's go over to North Africa. Let's sail across the Mediterranean. So they're sailing across the Mediterranean, getting supplies, bringing stuff back. And um, not super awesome leadership. And so what they, so, um, and, and this was a very lucrative thing, right? To be a captain on one of these ships, to be an admiral on one of these ships, to be a lieutenant or whatever, it's a big thing, right? So what was going on was the wealthy folks the privileged class were saying, hey man, I want my kid, mostly my son, right? I want my son to be a captain. Can he be a captain? Sure, he'll be a captain, right? Uh, you know, if the, guy, if the guy was a fantastic sailor, sure, he should be a captain, but they weren't necessarily fantastic sailors. So we're doing this trade between France and North Africa, France and North Africa, France. And, so one of these trips, this big armada is over there trading. They get a bunch of their whatever the heck they're trading. And they start getting ready to come back to France. And the experienced sailors say, hey, you know what? It looks kind of crazy. It looks like stormy weather. Maybe we shouldn't go out of port right now. But the leadership, which were generally crap, not great sailors, not a huge amount of experience, were like, what are you talking about, poor deckhand? You don't know what you're talking about. You know, you fool. We're sailing on because we're men. So they left port, they sailed into this massive storm. And, and, and the ships are all destroyed. And so that becomes the narrative. So the narrative becomes, oh, it's such a tragedy, this natural disaster, it was so hard, nobody could have predicted what would happen, and it's so bad, and it was just an act of God, right? Act of God, meaning I couldn't have done anything, wasn't my fault, oh well, so sad, too bad. Unbeknownst to the powers that be in France, some folks survived. And so a few folks survive, and that's what's being portrayed here, including this one uh, slave guy right here who rescued a bunch of folks, 
cobble them together on a raft, and they eventually float around, they eventually get rescued, they make it to one of these southern France, French ports, and they recover, and they start telling their story. But the story is not, doesn't jive with what the, power, the, the powers, you know, those in control want you to hear. So to try to get the story out, this, this painter, this article, the, the article, this artist does this massive painting. This is a big giant oil painting, like 10 feet wide, huge painting. And we have at the time what we call salons. And so what that is, is, hey, we go and we bring our art. You, maybe you're a poetry reader, maybe you're an opera singer, maybe you're a painter, and you bring your stuff to these uh, gatherings and cities and you showcase all the art together. And so he says, this is what I'm going to do. So he paints this painting, which, which just purely on its art is an awesome painting. If there was no, nothing else going, it was just a masterful work, just beautiful color and composition and all this kind of stuff. But he chooses his subject, um, this story. And so this painting is called The Raft of the Medusa. The Medusa is one of the ships that sinks. And he exhibits this. And this goes all around the south of France and eventually ends up in, in the Louvre. And it's a scandal, right? Because this story, I mean, this, this art, it's under the guise of art. So look at this pretty painting I painted, right? It's not an op-ed in the, in the newspaper, but everybody's seeing it. And it's a direct rebuke to what's going on. And so what's going on is we have all these poor sailors that are dying, right? And you have this one poor guy that is saying, you know, pulling everybody to safety and saying, help, 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 help. But he's ignored, right? And that, to me, is what, what came to mind when... I was watching all this stuff about Katrina, right? That it was like, that, that the powers that be, and again, it's hard for you guys to, experience, to, to, to understand this when you weren't there, but news reporters from Canada, from Great Britain, are like broadcasting on the BBC. This town is like, people are dying. Nobody's here. And then, period, end of sentence, cut away to Washington, D.C., and the federal government, again, the entity that's supposed to keep you safe when all the world is going to end, they're like, I don't know, everything's great. We got it under control. It just did not make sense at all. So one, I'll show you this one little video, then we'll take a, a bathroom break here. So this is um, a video. This is day 10. Let me say it again. This is day 10 after the storm struck. Okay. Okay. Um, and also just preface this by saying some of the things that are being talked about are not true because it's hard to get information out. But, but I'll just let you guys watch it. We'll watch at, that'll end and then they'll cut to talking to the local police chief and we'll just watch a minute or two of that and then we'll pause. So this is again day 10 after the storm struck. Still finding and removing the living from New Orleans. We begin with this report from Jeffrey Kay of KCET, Los Angeles. We may not be back in this area. They're talking 60 to 80 days for the water goes down. So I, I strongly urge you to get out now. Coaxing residents to abandon their homes is not in the job description of Louisiana State Wildlife and Fisheries Agents. I understand you, you lower up your to your animals. But you're gonna run out of food more, and when you need to take care of yourself you right now. Normally, this time of the year, game wardens would be out in the countryside for the opening of the dove hunting season. But with some 60% of the city of New Orleans waterlogged, their department has dispersed a flotilla of flat bottom boats for search and rescue missions. A lot of locals are used to flooding, and they still think this thing's gonna go down in a couple of days. So we're having a hard time getting in their head. This could still be a few weeks before we, even with the pumping out right now, getting all water out. And then if it's a real like, serious medical issue, issue then we may force them to leave. Yeah. So if you could tell our airboat operator, he's number one, you're number two, and when we get to 27, we're gonna start sending them out to the east. Teams from Louisiana and around the south have used hundreds of boats. Armed personnel, including sheriff's deputies from as far away as Albuquerque, provided escorts. Officials say the heavy weaponry and bulletproof vests were necessary protection. They worried about a repeat of earlier incidents in which snipers had fired at police and aid workers. As a law enforcement, I know it was a dream I'd have to wear body armor to come rescue people, unfortunately. But 
you know, I think the last few days we've gotten it under control. We really haven't had any incidents. And, uh, but you're wearing it. You're I'm wearing it because sure. you don't know. I mean, there's a lot of people that's been in here for a week, and I'm sure there might be a sense of cabin fever, and they, they're just, they don't know who to trust me at this point. This operation yesterday was in southwest New Orleans, close to the Garden District. Throughout the city, the waters are gradually receding, but they're contaminated by toxics and waste. And the flooded neighborhoods lack basic services, including communication. Many stranded residents haven't heard about the extent of the damage, and thousands have insisted on staying put. Get out of the water. Get out of the well, you know, it's going to rise up a little bit. But I didn't expect it to go this bad, so by the time it, it got to this point, I was like, well, I might as well just stay. Why? Uh, it really ain't no bother to me. Do you have any power? No, sir. You're running water? No, sir. Sewage? No, sir. But I'll make do. <laughs> Independent of state agents, National Guard troops conducted their own search and rescue operations in heavy trucks. The U.S. Coast Guard patrolled from the air, and private boat owners came to offer aid. Shannon Gamewell brought his boat to New Orleans from Arkansas to be a nautical good Samaritan. I just talked to my wife and I said, look, if you were here and Hattie was here, I would want somebody like me coming to get you, you know? And, and that's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm just a redneck with a mud buddy, you know? But in this type of situation, that helps. We got transportation till we leave. We just see us in this water going on, then we start going on out. Gamewell came across Shirley Johnson and her family and loaned her his cell phone so she could call her daughter in Atlanta. Tiffany? This is Shay. Yay! We still at home. We wait for the water to go down. I'm so glad to hear from y'all because we've been sick of the word. Yeah, I know. It's okay, Shirley. It's all right. It's okay. So we gonna be doing it. Later, as seen in video shot by a news hour producer, Gamewell encountered Warren Mahoney, a stroke patient. Since I had the stroke, and, you know, I need my medication and stuff like that. Yeah. I got enough medicine to last two, a couple of days, but I need that blood pressure medicine. Now, you stand right there. Okay, put your cane down. And, and, I mean, use, use your cane. Lean on your cane, because I'm coming. I've got to come up, okay? Gamewell helped Mahoney to his boat. Flag down a passing Air Force helicopter and helped carry the disabled man to the chopper so he could be evacuated. Game wardens hoping to find more residents like Mahoney yelled through open doors and windows. The welfare of pets was a main reason many people chose not to evacuate. Carolyn Mitchell was worried about the fate of the animals in the house she shared with three other people. How long do you figure you can stay there? Uh, another couple of days. So, that, I mean, we are, we've been trying to get out and make plans. So, so we just we really want to make sure that our animals will be taken care of. Eventually, game wardens persuaded the residents to put their own safety before that of their animals. They quickly packed belongings and were evacuated. In the next few days, officials may use more than persuasion. The New Orleans mayor has ordered all residents to leave the city. Margaret Warner has more on this story. She spoke with New Orleans police captain Marlon DeFillo a short time ago. He's the commander of the Public Affairs Department. Captain DeFillo, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Give us the latest on the evacuations. How many people were you able to evacuate today? Uh, a couple of hundred, nearly 1,000 individuals we evacuated, we evacuated today. Um, we still have a lot more people who are willing to be evacuated. 
and that's where we stand right now. Do you have a good sense of how many people there are and say where they are? So if you want to go in and get them, you can? Many of the areas that we're, we're focusing on now are public housing developments where we have a number of people who remain in their homes on the second and third floor. Uh, their first floor is underwater. But we are working to, mainly at this point, to relieve the city of those folks who are willing to leave the city who have been stranded for the last eight or nine days without food and water. Those are the people that we're concentrating on now. And are you still, are you all delivering food and water to anyone who is stranded, whether, whether voluntarily or whether they're refusing to leave? Yes, we are. But the, that can only go for so long. You know, we don't know if this is going to last a week, two weeks, a month, six months. So there is a mandatory evacuation because it is unsafe, it is unhealthy to be in the city at this time. We have not uh, completed the recovery process. We are still recovering from rescuing people. There is no running water. There is no electricity. So it, it is a hazardous situation at this time. So when do you think you may have to resort to forceful measures? Let me just say that the New Orleanians are smart. And once we began to tell them that there are no other options, that, that uh, it is apparent that you have to leave your home, and many folks will, will heed to that warning. Many folks, once you take those options away, they will comply and, uh, and, and leave. So in other words, you're saying that the mayor's new order last night, when you're able to tell folks that, that that's having an effect, that some people who had refused to leave now are ready to. There are. Okay. All right, you guys, let's, let's, let's keep going. Every online, we're, gonna, we're, keep, we're still going. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pick it back up again so we can uh, not go too late tonight. Um, okay, so, so the, main, the main organizing principle of our class is why, right? So we're there to help. Uh, we're going to be in Louisiana to help folks and, 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 and work on making things better um, through helping with you know, surveys, through installing food gardens, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, what you guys should be doing, which that's awesome, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a fun time. All kinds of, but ultimately, you guys should be asking why. Right? Why did this thing happen the way it did? Why is the recovery happening the way the recoveries happened? Why were these choices made? Um, uh, that kind of stuff. And, and you, can, you can each take your own individual take on it. Again, maybe you're more leaning into the environmental justice side of things. Maybe you're more into the policy. Maybe you're more into the, the ecosystem functions. Uh, th that's totally up to you guys to explore, but, but you do need to be asking why all the time. So when we go hear a guest speaker that talks to us, like, you know, ask him or her, like, you know, why? You know, wh why was it like that? You know, and, and, and really, was it, ex I, I, it sounds to me like X happened. Is that right? Did X really happen? Right, so, so, so ask folks, poke and prod. Um, so this is the uh, this is the story that increasingly many of many of we environmental types uh, seem to be uh, seem to be talking about. But so this is the story of the fall of Troy. And if you guys haven't been reading your your Greek literature, basically the there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on here. But but the main point for our issue is there's this lady Cassandra. Cassandra was was blessed with the gift of foresight, so she could tell the future. However, she was blessed and cursed. So she was both blessed with the gift of foresight and she was cursed with no one would ever believe her. So she was, uh, she was like, oh my God, oh my God, the city's going to be invaded and these guys are going to come in. And people are like, Cassandra, yeah, right, right. So nobody listened to her and indeed they thought she was crazy. Not only did they not listen to her, they thought, oh man, you should avoid this, this lady. And so I would, I would suggest there's, there's several examples of that that we could look through time. There's many more than this, but, but this, is a, this is sort of based on, at least the first few of these are based on this famous book called The March of Folly. And in that book, um, uh, in 1984, uh, uh, she lists the, this example as one example of folly, right? Didn't listen and it took in this Trojan horse and then it was... Uh, it, the city was invaded. You talk about the schism of the Catholic Church, right? Martin Luther nailing on the 99, uh, you know, let's do this differently uh, to the church door. And the Catholic Church is like, yeah, whatever, we got it. And instead, the, the Christian world splits mightily. Um, the British in North America, we talked a little bit earlier about, about um, the, um, 
uh, the, you know, the blessing of the hurricane to nuke their fleet, but, but, um, but basically that was a massive folly. They, they thought, oh, we can keep down these silly, uh, you know, peasants out there, and they got their butts kicked, right? Um, in more recent times, we could talk about the war in Vietnam, right? Another classic example. Oh, yeah, we'll go in and sh shoot all these people, and it'll be great, and everything. And no, it was horrible, right? More recently, examples, I would say, um, would be things like um, management of the coastline of the Gulf, which we'll talk about in a second, the Gulf of, of Mexico. Um, we could talk about how we manage and extract oil, um, for example, also in the same region in the, with the Deepwater Horizon, the BP oil spill. And, more, and most recently, we can talk about the, the COVID pandemic, right? People saying, hey, we should get prepared, we should get prepared, we should have us, and, you know, didn't listen, right? So there's all kinds of massive downsides from not listening to these prognosticators who are trying to warn of what could happen. Um, and because we, we often take a political lens on this way too early, um, we tend to get into trouble. And so one example of that is this. So this is a map of, that we say this is, you know, the U.S. This is typically what we think of. We think of something like this. We think of state boundaries. We think of political boundaries, that kind of stuff. And these are, these are a kind of a siren call, right? We get tricked into thinking that these different states in Mexico, or these different states in the U.S. Are, are real and that they're static and they're unmoving, right? That's crazy talk. So, so our coastline has been moving up and down for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years with the retreat of glaciers, the growth of glaciers, sea level goes up. So the coastline moves all around um, and it's moved substantially offshore, substantially onshore. So this area is dynamic. And indeed, the feeding of this landscape by the river and sediment is what keeps it uh, the, the way it is. But we've been actively messing with that system. We've been messing with that system for in a lot of different ways, but most explicitly when it comes to Louisiana, we've been messing with the Mississippi River. And so what this uh, image shows, is this an animation? This is, the, this is not an animation, this is a still image. Anyway, um, so what this is showing is this is southern Louisiana, and let me first orient you, this is our first shot of a map, and so whenever you see this, you're like, where am I? I don't know what this is. Here is an orientation. So this is the bird's foot delta, like, like a, a splayed out hand. So that's, that's where the Mississippi enters the Gulf of Mexico, enters the ocean. So when we got that going on, so that helps us orient ourselves. And then the next thing you should look for is this big giant hole right here. This is called Lake Pontchartrain. It's not technically a lake because it's, it's, it's connected to the ocean. But it looks like a lake. It seems to behave like a lake, right? So, so we use the term Lake Pontchartrain, even though it's sea, there's seawater in there. Um, and so, so here's the bird's foot delta. And then we can see, right, going through that, the Mississippi River. That helps us with our orientation. Here's the Mississippi River going up here. Lake Pontchartrain is right here. And then right south of Lake Pontchartrain is the city of New Orleans. So whenever we see these, 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 these maps, we're like, where are we? Take a look for the bird's foot delta. Take a look for Lake Pontchartrain, and you can find where New Orleans is, and you can start to get your, your bearings. Um, but having said that, what I want you to look at is the color here. Now, this, this is a couple years old. There's a new one supposedly being, be, being produced, or was produced last year. I don't have it. Um, but this is looking at changed wetland, okay? Wetland. Wetland, the area that's not terrestrial, not underwater, but betwixt and between those two areas. So the red represents measured loss of wetlands. So in other words, wetland that existed back in the day, but now is water. Is no longer, is no longer soil touching the, at, touching the atmosphere. The yellow is what's predicted, what was predicted over the next, that says 200, that's a bad figure of mine. That should be say 2000 to 2050. And so that is like the, 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 few, the 50 years forward going, right? We're almost halfway through that now. So red and yellow are loss. Green is the same thing, but addition. And what do you see, right? You see a crap load of red and yellow, not much green. So we see mostly loss, not much addition. The few little bits of addition are down here around some of the splays here in the birds for Delta. And then this area, which is uh, the, a Chafalaya Basin, um, which is another sort of river mouth. But everywhere else is red. 
is red, is red, is red, is red, is red. So um, our main re research site, our restoration site, which is up, up over here, it used to be, as the crow flies, if, you know, if we got a drone and just threw up in the air and said, go to the Gulf of Mexico, it used to be almost 60 miles to open Gulf water. Now it's like 14 miles. So this landscape is Swiss cheesing away in front of us. So that's the first context. Make sure we understand that. The wetlands are going away. Oh, I do have an animation. Look at that very, look at that, so, so fantastic. But it's not animating. Oh, perfect, okay, great, excellent. Yeah, that was not gonna work either. Okay, so we're losing this land from four main drivers, okay? So subsidence, this happens all the time. This is a natural process. This goes on all over the place. Our wetlands have a ton of plants. When stuff falls into these soils, they have a lot of water on them, so there's not a lot of oxygen. So it takes a long time for those stems, those leaves, that biological matter to break down. So as a consequence, our wetlands are very organically rich. They have a lot of organic, partly broken down stuff in there. Um, so just naturally, just left to their own devices, some of this stuff is going to break down over time and some of those soil particles are going to squish together. So there's a natural process that happens in, in wetlands where there's some level of compaction and it left with nothing else that's going to be at the, the level of the soil is going to go down, it's going to, going to subside. So there's a natural thing that goes on there and then there's the addition that we're doing, most explicitly when we suck stuff out of the ground. That could be water, but in this part of the world, that's mostly oil and gas. So just like you can imagine you have a soda, you have a Coke, and you put a straw in it, and you start sucking, you're sucking water out of the bottom of the soda glass, but the level of the, the top of the water, the top of the, the drink is going down, right? So that's subsidence. So one, we have subsidence happening across this region. Two, we have rising sea levels. So again, another process, which is natural, this has gone on for a long time, and so we just have a natural rise, rise of the average level of the surface of the ocean. But that's very, 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 very minuscule. You and I are changing that thanks to climate change. We're putting all this carbon and methane and stuff in the atmosphere. We're warming stuff up. And we're leading, amongst other things, we're causing the melting of glaciers. And so we're putting more water into the ocean basins. We're doing other things too. There's all kinds of other stuff. The water is actually heating up, so it's expanding. But, but basically, we are dramatically increasing the rate of the background level of sea level rise. So there's a background level of subsidence, but we're making it happen much more intensely. There's a background level of sea level rise, but we're, we're making it happen much more dramatically. Then the big, big deal locally is that we have put dams along the side of the Mississippi River. When a, left, when a dam goes across the a river, we call it a dam. When it goes alongside the river, we use the term levee. So we have levied the Mississippi River up the yin yang. Um, and that means that sediment, the, normally, the normal rainy, 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 or, or snow, 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 and then in the spring, the snow melts, we get these seasonal flushes of, of sediment that go down these, the, the waterway. And with it, it also brings sediment. Historically, it jumped the bank. During the flood season, it jumped out of the bank. And then that fast moving water slows down and then it drops that sediment. So that's a natural thing. By levying the Mississippi, we've stopped that. So we've stopped the addition of sediment. So normally, even with sea level rise, even with subsidence, if we had the normal the normal uh, seasonal flooding and deposition of sediment, that would counteract that for the most part. But we've stopped that. So that's a huge problem. And then we have some other hyper-specific things, such as the introduction, introduction of non-native things from South America. See, from South America. So nutria, which are kind of like a cross between a beaver and a rat kind of thing. These guys are massive eaters of vegetation. They're voracious eaters of vegetation. And so they are um, helping cause wetland loss by creating pockets of instability and stuff. So those four processes are screwing us up in terms of our wetland, uh, are facilitating wetland loss, are making wetland loss much, much worse. 
What do we do? Well, the ideal thing is get more sediment on the landscape, get more, get more soil particles out there, right? Combat this, this loss. To do that, we would need to take down the levees or at least do things like punch holes in levees so, they could, so that sediment could flood out. And the term for that is a diver, uh, uh, an engineered design <coughs> term for that is a diversion, where we would, we would direct sediment rich water into areas that are, say, um, you know, now standing water because the, the soil, the, the surface of the soil is so low, put a diversion in there and then let that soil build back up. Um, we could also do things like stop sucking on that straw, right? We could stop taking out all the oil and gas. That would help as well. Um, uh, we could kill all the nutria, which would help as well. And then people have proposed other uh, in innovative solutions, things like trying to encourage more plant growth so those plants would hold on to more sediment and all this kind of stuff. There's all kinds of other things. But, but these are all ideas we could try. The most important thing, the thing that we must have happen is we must get more sediment onto the landscape or this system will be gone. Um, why did we, why did we levy the Mississippi? Because of this, right? So sometimes we get into problems in the environment because we did something either stupidly or we did something, um, we didn't understand it was going to be a, a, a bad impact. DDT, pe people thought DDT was a great thing. We thought, oh, this is, a, this is not as problematic as these other things we were trying and it's doing a good thing, right? Turns out DDT causes all these problems. But people weren't actively, you know, it was, it was an unintended consequence, right? Um, oftentimes, we're getting into these problems these days. Of course, there's still unintended consequences, absolutely. But also because we're too good at what we do. And that's the case here. We are too fantastic. Uh, 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 we're such fantastic engineers we cause problems for ourselves. So we did such a good job putting these walls along the Mississippi. We did such a good job at controlling the flooding that we actually really controlled the flooding. But we lost these other things too. And so what spurred us to be super strong engineers were things like this. This is this flooding event in the 1920s where all kinds of farms, all kinds of homes, all kinds of businesses and commerce and everything was, was submerged. Um, and this uh, happens all over the place. It happened in Florida, happens in Arkansas, happens in Mississippi, all over the place. And so people get pissed off. And they say, we need to stop this. So this is the era where, yeah, we're do. mostly it's men, not all, but mostly. Hey, uh, this sucks. I'm gonna tell nature what it's gonna do. And I'm going to dictate to you, nature, you just won't flood anymore, right? Incredibly arrogant, incredibly full of ourselves, incredibly delusional. But that's what we were thinking. Oh, my God, the flood happened? Well, then we're going we're gonna to be the saviors and, and tell nature how it's going to work. Okay. And that's translated into this mass. That's not just a problem in Louisiana, again, a lot of these problems we might be looking at in Louisiana, but they apply all across the globe. So for example, here in the San Francisco Bay areas, we're looking at almost everything you see that's gray around the bay was open water or wetlands back in the day, and we filled it in. Um, in the case of the San Francisco Bay area, mostly because of the gold rush, because of strip mining in the Sierras, and then having that, that sediment go down the river and fill in those, those wetlands, bury them. In this case, we buried them as opposed to made them go away. But whether we bury them or whether we, we make them um, standing water, we're losing these important ecosystems. So in the lower 48 states over the last 150 years, we've lost about half of the wetlands that used to exist around in our, in our country. But certain areas have got it worse. And so we in California have the worst proportional loss so we didn't have as much absolute wetland as other states did. But what we did have, we've been really hammering away. So we've lost, we lead the nation in the proportion of wetland loss. We've lost 91% of our historic wetlands. So you're coming from the state of California with the greatest proportion of wetland loss, and we're going to Louisiana 
which is the state with the greatest qu absolute quantity, greatest absolute acreage of wetland loss. And so Louisiana has also lost about half of their historic wetlands, but they had so much more to begin with, it is a massive change to the landscape. Whereas in California, it tends to be more pockets here, pockets there, bit here, bit there. Okay, so, um, so these, these are the things we talked about. Subsidence, sea level rise, the levying of the river, and, and then the addition of nutria. And so some of these, like these first few, have been going on f throughout history. It's just, we, it's just we made them more intense, right? But these other things, the levying and the nutria, these are novel. The, these, these, the system didn't evolve with these, with these stressors. And then the other thing we need to add on to here are hurricanes. Hurricanes were also something that has always existed. So a hurricane can come in and cause some localized damage to wetlands. And, and, and these are a pulse disturbance. So these are a disturbance that happens right, right now, and then it doesn't happen, right? Whereas these other things, these other four are going on day in, day out. And it turns out that these pulse disturbances are becoming more and more problematic. And this is a nutria. If you guys are, want to know what a nutria looks like, that's a nutria. Okay, um, we're getting late, so we'll, we'll, we'll be continuing this uh, on uh, in a future talk. But, but let me, um, I want to get to a, a good stopping point at least. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk about this political landscape that we t typically think of, this political geography that we think of, and add on hurricanes. So again, here's that, here's that landscape. It's kind of like that photo I showed you at the start. This is just a, an older plot of it. Here is Hurricane Betsy. Betsy was the last hurricane to make a direct hit on the city of New Orleans, 1965. And this is the path. So this is the actual, and, and in this case, this, this visualization, the hotness of the color is the strength of the storm. So it was, it was strong, it was, it was spinning around in the Gulf, and as soon as it, it comes on the land, our hurricanes always lose strength, right? They, they get cut off from that warm, hot water, that fuel, so as soon as the hurricane hits land, it's going to stop dropping in terms of intensity and start to dissipate. Um, it still could be bringing a lot of rain, so, but, 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 but the, the craziness will always be going downhill once we hit the land. And so you see, so see this hurricane came up, kind of was heading towards the, the, you know, the Carolinas, and then it, whoop, it paused, and it, it, it spun around, and then it went, and it bang hit Katrina. Now, uh, hit Katrina, hit Katrina, hit New Orleans. So now... And this is the same story all over the place. This is the story with us with wildfires, with the Thomas fire. This is this with uh, Woolsey, Woolsey fire, the Northridge earthquake. You pick, right? This is a general human phenomenon in response to disasters. So people that live in New Orleans, um, they're not stupid. They're not idiotic. But a lot of folks were like, do we really have to worry about it? Do we really have to plan for this? Right? So I am old. It's true. Right? I am old. Uh, John and I are old. Tom is older. We should always make jokes about Tom when he's not here, but he's the oldest one. But, um, but this is basically, <laughs> actually, Tom was alive when this happened. Tom was alive when this hurricane happened. Nobody else in this class was alive when this happened. But, um, but right, so, so, you know, if I was somebody that lived in New Orleans, my whole life, I never experienced a direct hurricane. I've experienced hurricanes and rain and stuff, but I never experienced a direct hit, right? So part of the getting us lulled into inaction is using a bad mental model, using a historic guide that maybe isn't the best thing to serve us in the future, right? And so people are saying like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's gonna be bad, it's gonna cause problems, but, and you heard it, you heard it on, that, on, that, on that news clip we watched. Well, I didn't think it was gonna get this bad, right? Oh, I didn't know it was going to be like this, right? Why? These are all the storms between 1965 and Hurricane Katrina, right? Now, they're not all, they're not all hurricanes, but um, I think these folks live in a storm area, right? So yes, maybe we lucked out, and for several years, one didn't hit us directly, but it's coming. It's com Before the storm hit, a friend of mine who... Um, went to grad school with, who's from New Orleans, and moved back to New Orleans, worked for Audubon there for a while and other things. Um, and because, because he's a friend of ours, and because he uh, you know, is in New Orleans, 
he has a brother who was indicted <laughs> because that's how politics go, goes there. Anyway, um, so, so he used to say before 2005, he'd tell me, you got to come to New Orleans. And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah no, I, I've been there. But you got you to come visit. I'm like, yeah, no, I'll come visit sometimes. like, no, dude, you got to come. And I'd say, okay, why? He said, because the next storm that hits us, the city is done. It's dead. So, again, this was appreciated and realized by some people, but not everyone. And not everyone was listening to that Cassandra call. Okay, another example of the challenges of this landscape. So here again, here's the political geography. Any guesses as to what that is? What? False. Ooh, false. Good guess, but not false. Uh, ooh, good guess. So maybe, maybe some type of seawall or, or, or um, uh, water control structure. No. Pipelines. So, so, so these are, these are this is oil and gas infrastructure. These are pipelines. This is oil. These are oil wells, primarily offshore. These are natural gas wellheads. It is hard to explain how Swiss cheesed this area is. National parks, wellhead. State parks, wellhead. Somebody's home, wellhead. Somebody's farm, wellhead. I mean, it is this oil and gas run this state. I don't mean like power this state. I mean, they run this state. And so this, and indeed this is, the, the, and, and I mean, run the state, but they also supply oil and gas for us, right? So they supply a huge fraction of our oil and gas um, that's produced inside the continental United States. California, we, back in the day, we were number one, but now we're like number seven, right? So we've, we've pretty much played out most of our oil and gas deposits, even though we have active oil and gas production still going on in places like here in Ventura County and in Kern County. This is this landscape, right? So the question is, why are there so many oil and gas uh, wells? That's one we should explore over the course of the class. So I'll just say that um, it's important that you guys realize this is a very, 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 very poor state. Um, uh, not a lot of resources. And Oil and gas was an industry that said, hey, these are some good paying jobs. These are some consistent um, uh, putting bread on the table and, uh, and, and good stuff. And so it's more complicated than that, but I'd say that, that that's the starter conversation, is that this was money in a place that didn't have a lot of money. But, that, but we need to explore that throughout the class. We need to ask, why is oil and gas so strong here? Well, I mean, one, one is that there's deposits here, right? If there, wasn't, if there weren't oil deposits here, we wouldn't have as much. So one is just the, the occurrence of this resource there. But then as to why is it so intense, that's, that's the question about um, folks not having a lot of money and power. This is a consequence of that. This is a consequence of that. So this is... Um, uh, one example of wetland loss, and you guys, it might be hard to see. It's, it's kind of, it's a really dark photo. Let's see if I have another one. Okay, this one might be a little easier to see. Okay, so here we're looking at, this is, this is a river. Okay, this is like a, water, you know, a, a tributary, right? And this brown stuff, this is wetland. This is vegetated wetland, marsh. Uh, so if it's mostly herbaceous stuff, you know, soft tissues, we call that a marsh. If it's mostly woody, we call that a swamp. But they're, they're all sort of transition between pure dry, pure wet uh, systems. So in this case, we're mostly looking at a, a marsh system, so a, a grassy wetland type of, type of system. And uh, okay, so here we go. So, so here's a natural uh, side channel, a tidal channel, right? So bloop, 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 like it's going like, oh my gosh, it's turning right, left. It's, it's sinusoidal. It's kind of S-shaped, kind of doing this stuff. And it's doing, then oh, what? Then it hits this giant straight right here. This is natural. This is human. And we can look through all of these pictures. It, straight channel. The, nature abhors a straight line, unless we're talking about a crystal. 
And so what's gone on here is these humans have gone on and are extracting oil and gas right there. And so the way to extract oil and gas is to, it's probably easier for you guys to see on this picture, is, is, is based on the way that we first started harvesting trees, cutting down the cypress trees back there. So this is a very hard landscape, to, a very hard matrix to get through, right? If anybody um, has helped Brenton out with any of his endangered species surveys, if anybody was helping out with our, our Tidewater Gobi ones last time we, we had that, 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 that um, class, um, it's hard to move through the wetland. It's, it's muddy, it's swampy, it's easy to pull your ankle. It's just, it's just, it's just hard, right? It's, it's, it's difficult. And so what people have invented to, to do things like, like move stuff around and put something is we float. We float stuff. So we use the water. So what's gone on here is somebody's decided, oh, I want to put an oil and gas wellhead over here, let's say, right? So oil and gas, you know, it's not like we're going to go out. If we we're just fishing, you and I would just walk out and we'd go fish and we'd come back and we'd be done. But these guys need to go back and forth to the site many times, right? Maybe they need to lay pipeline. Maybe they need to bring you know, drills and all that. So you got, you got to do a lot of work. So what they do is they come here and they use an excavator. So they have a floating boat. They have a, a, a basically um, a dump bucket on a, on a floating raft. And they dig into the soil right here. They dig into the sediment right here and they rip it up and they turn the arm 45 degrees and they dump it right here. And they dig this up and they dump it. So they both create a channel and a bank. And, and, and so they create a little patch that's drier and they create a channel. And then once that's done, it's really easy to go on this bank and put our drilling, drilling stuff or to even just use that to pull material. So this, this, this excavated uh, trench or, or channel and the spoils that are piled up next to it that's a classic signal of humans messing with these wetland systems. And that Swiss cheese is all around this area. So when we have things like a hurricane that come in, like Katrina, this is what happens. So, um, so here is, here is um, some barrier islands. These are chandelier islands. And so, so again, this, we're here in the, in the boot tip of Louisiana, right? Again, here's our bird foot, bird's foot delta to orient us. Here's Lake Pontchartrain. So New Orleans is going to be right here, so we can all figure out where we are. And then I've just gone to this area right here and blown this up. And so what we see in these barrier islands, we see some sand in the front, right, where, where the waves are striking. And then the protected area behind, we see vegetated wetland. So that's a classic barrier island dynamic. And so if we look at this, here's a, an example. And the yellow arrow, arrow is for reference. So here's what it looked like, um, this particular site, in 2001. Here's what another one of these sites looked like also in 2001. And again, the yellow arrows are, arrows are for reference. And then Katrina came through. So just the winds and the, and the storm impact turned these places into this, right? Ripped up all of these islands. And so the storm is going to start with these, these little bit of nucleating things. So maybe the nutria ate a little bit of a hole right here and created a little bit of a, a place for the wind to have more fetch. And they're going to feed back on each other. So all of this red area was ripped out. Um, this is near where uh, John um, uh, and Tom and I went right after uh, Katrina. This is, this is near this place called Holly Beach. Um, and not only does... Not only does the storm nuke, obviously, the, the native landscape, the natural landscape, it does people as well. So this is this town of Holly Beach that um, we went to um, basically a few months after the storm. And this is what it looked like right after the storm. So um, this is, uh, this is a, essentially a radar measurement, light, LIDAR of all the homes. This was, uh, people call this a redneck Riviera. So this is where people could have a summer home that didn't have a lot of money, right? So a lot of these inter interior towns, very hot, very humid in the summer. It's difficult, right? And so this is a place you have a little beach home that wasn't very expensive, but you could go there with your family and be cool. And this is where this is working class folks. This isn't this isn't like wealthy resort type area. And basically everything is swept clean. And when we went through it, all like the cars and stuff were, were blown into the wetland inland. And so this is what it looked like when we 
um, when John and I were driving through there. So uh, the first thing they did was, um, and so this was impacted not so much by Katrina, but by Rita, which we'll talk about. So Rita was a second hurricane that came a couple weeks after. Katrina went up, hit, hit New Orleans, hit, hit the eastern side of the state of Louisiana. Rita hit the western side near the Texas border and basically took out all the stuff. And so, so we talk about response, there's, there's weird things that happen. So all these people's houses are gone, right? But the, the, um, the stuff that was buried, so the, um, the fire hydrants, they were still there, right? So there'd be water pipes going up to people's property and there'd be no buildings left because everything had been you know, literally scraped off and thrown to the wetland. Um, some folks had come by and re-put in new power lines. They put in new stop signs. All these were removed. And so it's kind of interesting that I guess we have stop signs now, so I guess it's safe to drive around. But, but some things get fixed really fast because of luck or chance or, or whatever. And so this also adds to the craziness of the recovery when you see this kind of like, you know, it, it, it confuses you. You're like, wait, why are there stop signs on a beach and, and things of that nature? So this is fundamentally a human dominated system, this whole area of Louisiana, even though we're driving around, it's gonna look natural. It's absolutely oil and gas. Everything is totally um, uh, uh, cr uh, crazy, totally human dominated. Um, another thing for us to, that is important for you guys to understand is here is New Orleans. So this is um, right here. This is Lake Pontchartrain, right? So that's for orientation. Here is the Mississippi, where am I? Where's, my, where's my thing? Here is the Mississippi River, right? This area right here is called English Turn. That's what Tom's going to talk about next week when we start. This is where we have our, our wetland restoration stuff going on. But this is the next thing I want you to look at right here. Why is my thing keep disappearing? This guy right here. This is the so-called oxbow. And this is where the French Quarter is right here. So this is the, the classic core of New Orleans, the original founding of New Orleans. Why is New Orleans here? New Orleans here because it was a, a game path for folks that were on the river to get to Lake Pontchartrain, where there was great fishing and shellfish and stuff. So have a look. If you're in this city, the river makes an edge over here, right? And then we have these other canals and things over here. So we're basically almost an island. We're not an island, but we're almost an island. In terms of dealing with disasters, we easily can be on an island. We have this thing, which is cause, called the causeway, which is a giant bridge that goes over the, the Lake Ponch train. But that actually got knocked down during the storm, so you couldn't use it. So really, New Orleans is something of a bowl. And also, by way of introduction, before we start talking about uh, the hurricane, it's important for you to understand that this is a low, this is, this is low, low elevation. So the whole city of New Orleans is not underwater, but a good chunk of it is but it didn't all start out underwater. So when we started establishing the city of New Orleans, we started living there. And initially, we all lived very close to the river. Ironically, the highest land in New Orleans is right next to the Mississippi River. This maybe doesn't sound intuitive, but this is how rivers work. So this natural levee right here, the natural buildup of sediment, it just happens all the time with rivers. So in a flood event, the flood will jump that, that lip and then flood down over here. But ironically, the safest place in terms of elevation is right up close to the river. And as we go backwards, or as we go towards Lake Pontchartrain, it gets lower and lower and lower. That's the natural landscape. And then when humans moved in, we started pumping the water out actively. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, so it's more livable. So the ground is drier. So we actively remove, and you'll see, we first, when I first pick you guys up in the airport, and we first start driving around, you're gonna, we're gonna drive around, and say, oh, there's a freeway. I'm like, what the hell is that? And these big, giant pipes just coming out of the ground. So all throughout this region, we actively, every single day of the year, suck the water out. Now, initially, that was to deal with flooding, and so it'd be easier to build. But then people kind of said, oh, it's dry. Well, that's great. Let's build here and then let's move over there and let's suck out some more water and some more water. And so, so we, we, this is a feedback loop. And then most recently we levied the city of New Orleans, as we'll talk about. 
we levied the city of New Orleans, and that further helped encourage subsidence. So the city of New Orleans has a lot of low spots, but we humans have made them lower than they historically were. So all this stuff is going on. Um, yeah, and so this is the landscape into which we're gonna go travel. So this is down near the Bird's Foot Delta. This is near a place called Venice, Louisiana. And this is some of my students from a, a previous class. And everything we're looking at should not be wet. So the, we, I pulled off the van off the road right here, and, and this is all water. This is all dead cypress trees. Cypress trees are a plant. Now, we have seagrass, which is an angiosperm that lives in the ocean and lives its whole life in the ocean. But that's a weird-ass plant. Most plants aren't like that. Most plants need to be in the air, need to be on land. So even though cypress trees are massively awesome awesome trees. They're, they're, they're closely related to our redwood trees. They're awesome, beautiful trees. They've evolved in this landscape being inundated all the time, but not 100% of the time. So they can take being wet a lot of the year, but to germinate, their seeds need to be on dry land. And to start growing, they need to be on, you know, sort of dry land. So what we're looking at in this landscape is you see no terrestrial area. You see no land, even though it used to be land. And you see all these dead cypress trees. They're dead because they've drowned. And so this landscape is what Louisiana is turning into. And so that's not good for food. That's not good for ecosystems. That's not good for people. That's not good for anything. And this is what we're dealing with. Um, I think, I think we'll, I'll, I'll do two or three more slides and we'll pause for the night. So this is um, uh, something, I'll, I'll, I'll send a link to this. I hope I still have a link. The, the newspaper has been bought out, which is a whole other story, bought out because they criticized a powerful person, and so he decided he was going to buy the newspaper. And he's since bought the Times-Picayune, the local newspaper, and now it's a, city, it's a subsidiary of, of another newspaper. So the, the archives have been getting weird in recent years. But in any event... This is a series called Washing Away from the Times-Picayune, which is historically the local newspaper. Notice the date. This is 2002. Katrina happened in 2005. And so this was a, a previous hurricane. Hurricane George came through and turned away at the last minute. And so this, this article is about what if Hurricane George hadn't turned? This would have been the storm track. And, oh my God, look at all this horrible crap that would have happened, right? So this is predicted. This is, this, is, this is modeled. This is people warning folks. This isn't coming out of the blue. Much of this was ignored. When you, you guys watched, hopefully, the storm, right? One of the things they talked about was a federal disaster exercise mm -hmm. that they were going through. Hey, let's do this, and what if this happens, and how are we going to respond, and okay... And then they cut funding, right? Because, you know, we got to be responsible stewards of our government, right? So we cut funding. And so, so the, the, the action plans in the case of that federal plan, that it was like, you know, figure out what to do with the buses, and then there's no, it's just blank on the sheet, right? Yeah. And so here, this is the same idea. Like, oh my God, look, we got to be careful, because if we, if we get hit by another storm, this is what's going to happen, right? Eh didn't really pay attention, didn't really listen. Um, and so this, is, this becomes important because the rhetoric that you're going to start to hear, that we'll get into the next time we return to this subject, you're going to hear from all these leaders, we didn't know, Meh. who could have predicted, act of God. That is all bullshit. That is absolute bullshit. People knew if, if our leaders were, if you hear any of our leaders say something like, well, we didn't know that, Maybe you chose to not know, right? Or maybe you were busy fighting a million other fires, and I get it. But you can't say that no one knew. It's the same with us with wildfires. Oh, my God, we got to be careful with the wildfires. It, there's going to be a fire, 100%, I predict. It's going to happen. Is it going to happen tomorrow? I don't know if it's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next week, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, right? We talk about the town of Paradise that was destroyed in a wildfire. That town was almost destroyed in the 90s. And then and they escaped. 
and we're coming back together. And the, the contractors that were hired by the city to figure out what to do, they said, you know what, you, this ain't gonna work. This place, the next fire that comes, this is a death trap. We can't get everybody out, evacuate in time. We have all these old folks that don't have cell phones. We can't get the warnings out, et cetera, et cetera. The, the town leaders in paradise were like, ah, well, we'll just have to do a phased evacuation then. That didn't work well for the hundreds of people that died, or the almost hundreds of people that died, right? And so we must demand, and I, we, I get these are hard decisions and these are tough, but you need, as, as the youngins here, as the, as the leaders of our, uh, the, our next leaders, you need to demand, not in an a-hole way or jerky way, but you need to say, hey, dude, what about washing away, <laughs> right? This is a real challenge. And don't let folks put it off. Don't let folks say, well, you know, we need to study it more. Of course, as a scientist, we're going to say we need to study more. But we need to look at these warnings seriously. Sure. No money's being sure. Proven to this, and then that's what they like start to develop and take more advantage of. Sure. The already like existing right. pots of oil. Right. So, so for those of you guys online that couldn't maybe hear the question, that the idea was, hey, so, so what about when we have these marginalized communities in the wake of a disaster? They're they're not very powerful. They don't have a lot of resources to begin with, and then a disaster comes in, and they get their butts kicked. And then do do the folks that do have deep pockets come in? in the wake and, and buy up stuff and do stuff? The answer is, yup, yup. 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 So, California. so I yeah, I mean, one of the things I was super worried about when we first started this class was I was desperately afraid that New Orleans was dead um, because, because of all that you're talking about, right? Because New Orleans is a poor city. The culture is very diverse. It's got, you know, highbrow stuff. It's got wealthy stuff. It's got poor stuff. So in New Orleans, the cool kid in high school ain't the, ain't the football quarterback, right? The cool kid in high school is the saxophone player, is the trumpet player, right? Um, the music culture is passed on from family to family to family to family. Similarly, the, the food culture, fam, you, know, you know, parent to child, et cetera, very, very strong. And one of the worries was that in the wake of this, who is going to come in the not to demonize Disney, but the Disney's of the world, right? The Disney's of the world and come in and, and, and change the culture and get rid of, you know, the communities that make the culture as rich as it is. And then all of this magic would go away, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that we should build the culture on the backs of poor folks or marginalized folks, but, but that's the magic that is New Orleans, is that for all the horrible crap that these people have experienced and been exposed to, they're still there. They're still there making awesome music and awesome food and awesome art. And, and um, the worry was that this gentrification and this, this um, changing of stuff would completely break this historic culture. Thankfully, it hasn't. It has had, it's had huge impacts. But one of the things that, is, that we'll see is um, so the gentrification stuff is, is maybe not ideal, right? And we maybe don't want to see. But another magic thing that's happened is a bunch of you all have moved there. So about 12 of our alumni have moved there after the class, either permanently or for short term to work for NGOs. But not just us, young people from around the country have moved there because they're like, hey, this is a place that's effed up, but they want to do stuff differently. And so it's a very exciting place if you want to try some of these new urbanist ideas, some of these new, they don't all, don't all work by any means. It's not like a panacea, it's not perfect, but, but, but that happened, the, the, as, we'll, as we'll see in a little bit, that happened, but other things happened that we didn't predict that were gonna happen that sort of acted as some, somewhat of a counterbalance and a new energy, a new vibrancy coming in. Another thing is we have a crap load of more, um, more tamale stands and way the hell more burritos way the hell more Spanish language music because the building community that came in to do the rebuilding was mostly Mexican and Latin American immigrants and they brought their culture. I mean, there's already some of that there, but to be sure, but, but they actually added a, the next wave of cultural diversification in, in uh, the greater New Orleans area. 
So, so, so not everything was bad from the storm, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but the answer is, uh, did stuff change? Absolutely. Do, do powerful folks come in when, when folks are on their knees and sort of take advantage and buy the house for super cheap? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, why don't we just finish on this? We'll finish with one, more, one or two more slides. So this is what Katrina was. So this is an animation. This is time lapse, of course. But this is Hurricane Katrina. Forms, gets tight, boom, forms a tight eye wall, and then boom, goes wax um, uh, Louisiana. And so um, the thing I want to just add before we, we end tonight is that one of the things you're going to hear that's total baloney, one of the things you're going to hear is the, flood, the levee protection system, the flood protection system for New Orleans, it was created in the wake of these hurricanes in the 60s that caused all this damage. U.S. Congress said, never again. Our president said, never again. We're going to build this, we're going to levee off New Orleans so it doesn't flood again. When this happened and all the destruction, which we'll talk about, and not tonight, but we'll talk about next time. Um, when that happened, the powers that be, in this case, the Army Corps of Engineers, the entity that was supposed to be in charge of building that and making sure that protection system was working, they were saying, hey, man, Congress only said that we had to build it to, to withstand a Category 3 storm. And they'll show, you, they'll show you videos like this. And they'll say, look, man, Category 5 wasn't our fault. Act of God. That is straight up bullshit. So here, it's a category one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. So it was a, a category five when it was out here. When it made landfall, it was not a category five. It was a category three. When it struck Beerus, where, where we will go, and made landfall there, it was a category three. By the time it goes up to the coast and gets to New Orleans, it was a category one storm. So the levee protection system failed a category one strength storm when it was supposed to withstand a category three storm. So this is very common in these disaster situations. Rarely do people say, there was no storm, because you're like, dude, there was a storm. But folks will play fast and loose with the facts. And how are you supposed to know, right? You, I just put a slide up. It said Category 5. You guys haven't been there. Of course, Category 5. And someone says, we didn't design for a Category 5. Totally understandable. But we need to be more sophisticated than that. We need to, to understand the specifics of what happened. So when people say the baloney, our baloney detectors will catch it. So this is the last slide I'll just show to talk about the scale of this. And we'll, and we'll pick this up. Um, uh, next time we'll talk about forest, we'll set the time after next. So this is, um, at the time, this is the highest storm surge ever recorded in the continental United States. So here's the states I have here. And so this is, as it was, so as, as Hurricane Katrina was making landfall in Bay St. Louis, which is Mississippi, it was a little bit to the east of New Orleans, 30 foot storm surge. It was 18 feet in Buras, where we're going to go. Um, 30 feet. Let me remind you, the storm surge, that is not a wave that's 30 feet high. That is the ocean water goes to 30 feet high and stays that way for about 10 hours. Right? Even here, even here at, sitting in our campus in Channel Islands, we would be underwater if we had a 30 foot storm surge here, let alone in that flat pancake of a place. And so I'll skip this, but this is what happened to the city of New Orleans. This is an insane photo. This is one of the most insane photos I've ever seen in my life. You, again, without the context, this looks like a weird storm photo for you. What we're looking at is we are standing, we are standing right about here, or actually, sorry, we're standing right about here, looking this way into Lake Pontchartrain. And what's happening is the storm surge is bringing water over the top of the levee. So this looks like a tidal wave. This is just water like a waterfall pouring into the city. A waterfall as far as the eye can see from right to left. It's just pouring on in, pouring on in, pouring on in. And that happened because the storm is only a category one storm, but the water, but the fetch 
the wind blowing on Lake Pontchartrain is blowing it into the city from the north now, from the north. So we'll pick up the details of what happens as the levees start to fail and what happens to the folks and everything. But, but that's a setup for Katrina.